Hello and welcome to season four, episode 26 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are, of course, reading Alan Ryan's On Politics, a book describing the history of political theory from Herodotus to the modern day. And this time we're looking at Marxism, fascism, and dictatorship. Of course, very big philosophies in the 20th century uh, and sort of the impact that they had on the world. Uh, so some really interesting stuff, uh, and I'm excited to to get into it. Do you have any opening thoughts? You're looking at me blankly. Well, you're in such a hurry to get into it. Let's get into it. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we start off with totalitarianism, Stalinism, fascism, and irrationalism, which are you know four of the big topics we'll be talking about. Uh, and he begins with this notion that to do just justice to some interesting thinkers, we should distinguish between supporting irrationalist policies and analyzing the place of irrationalist attachments in our political lives. So we are going to be talking a lot about Nazism and fascism and, and Stalinism and just by analyzing them and seeing, you know, where they come from and their and their merits, uh, essentially, you know, what what, um, you know, sort of logic they draw on does not mean that we support Stalinism, fascism or Nazism, of course. Uh, really? just... I thought any time you read a subject that you became an acolyte mm. uh, of whatever you're reading. Isn't that true? That's I... what some, pe- some people think that some people yeah. think that if you, um, if you read something or you're aware of it or that, you, you know, that you've studied it, that somehow you're, a, you're a devotee that, that is your beliefs. Mm. I don't think that's the case. They aggravate me. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> but he says through this chapter to totalitar- totalitarianism, must be understood as shorthand for a set of political phenomena that includes dictatorship, one-party rule, systematic violence against enemies, including but not confined to political dissidents, the use of state terror as an everyday instrument of government, the destruction or politicization of all institutions, save those created or run by the ruling party, and the systematic blurring of the line between the public and the private, all this in the interests of securing the total control of a political elite over every aspect of life. So a very long definition of totalitarianism there, uh, but to kind of put it briefly, one party rule, crushing of all dissidents um, in order to to preserve this one party rule, essentially at, at its core is what totalitarianism here means. And as we'll see, it applies to, to Stalinism, fascism, and uh, of course, Nazism. And from there, we move into irrationalism. Uh, he says that sometimes it is said that political theory died after World War II with the waves of irrationality sweeping over the world. Uh, there's this belief that the masses would always prefer the rabble rousing of the demagogue over really more robust political theory in and of itself. Uh, But he says, however, Russian Stalinism, German Nazism, and Italian fascism were deeply attractive to some intellectuals, although Nazism was largely anti-theoretical and anti-intellectual. But he says, uh, because the the fascist became a term of abuse rather than analysis, the intellectual components of the idea have been obscured. And I think that's very true, and I think we especially see that today. Um, where it's essentially, you know, any belief that I don't like, I'm going to label that as fascist, and it is evil, and we cannot talk about it. Um, I think we see that all the time, um, and I'm sure you agree with that sentiment there. I do. And, you know, I, did, I, I was a little, I'm a little confused by even the term of irrationalism, as if it, if, if, if it really exists. I mean, it, it seems to me that... Um, people like to attribute irrationalism to people that disagree with them. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. there's a certain, uh, you know, similar to, you know, current populist movements in, in, um, in the United States, it's like they, they, they they would call that irrationalism, but there's a, there's, it seems like there's always a philosophical underpinning to Mm -hmm. it. I wouldn't say that Nazism didn't have some sort of political philosophy I mean, obviously, there's the the anti-Semitism, the racism, and all that stuff. Um, but but they had a they had a system of government, you know, and they, they had it wasn't irrational. Mm-hmm. I, I I'm viewing like irrational a bunch of people like you know dressed in silly costumes bumping <laughs> into each other. You know, they didn't have any. There's like there's no. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, yeah, it's it's, it's it wasn't random, you know. I think like usually when we think of irrationalism, it's like just random stuff. You know, there's no basis to anything. There's no logic, but there was logic and there was like a rational basis. You know, however bad it may be for Nazism and fascism and uh, Stalinism and things like that. So it's you know not entirely, I don't think, accurate that these things were just random and without thought. There was definitely thought put into them, even if it was bad thought that we disagree with very strongly. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm kind of confused as to you know what is, what, what what are we looking at here? What I mean specifically when we're talking about irrationalism, I guess it's just uh, demagogues, you know, just trying to whip up people into a frenzy. 
But I, but I always think that's that's always overstated. It seems to me there's always yeah. some sort of philosophy behind it, some sort of first principles behind everything. I mean, because mm-hmm. people don't get whipped up into a frenzy just d- d- just because. I mean, there's, yeah. there's always some argument b- behind it. It may be a, a bad argument, uh, and of course, you can play to emotions as part of your your argument. But um, I don't know. I don't. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm not. I'm I'm not seeing the irrationalism as a political thought. I mean, I think, you yeah. know, it seems contradictory. Mm-hmm. Well, he goes on to say that the, the 20th century was said to be the century of ideology in that, you know, uh, really ideas were espoused whose logic was in their capacity to incite their hearers to action rather than to provoke them to thought. So I think that's where he's really drawing on on this idea of, uh, of irrationalism and that, you know, the, the ideas presented, you know, even if they do have logical basis, it's not to get people to think about them, it's to incite them to action. Uh, but he does have a, a, a good quote here. He says, intellectuals seem not merely to fall for nonsense as uncritically as anyone else, uh, but to be especially prone to create new forms of it, um, which I think is very true. You know, just because, you know, some intellectual, some professor somewhere says something does not mean that, you know, just because they are intellectual means that it is, you know, 100 percent sound. You know, sometimes, you know, these people just do say things that are complete and utter nonsense and are just more, uh, I guess, usually more fluent in, in, in just espousing it to make it sound like it makes sense. Uh, I think that's something to keep in mind, uh, especially today. As I get older, I become more anti-intellectual. Really? Yeah, and, and I think it's because what, what I mean by, by intellectuals are people that, that um, have read a lot and have studied a lot, but don't know anything. Mm-hmm. If it makes any sense. You know, it's like the, 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 uh, and so you know, the, the, the people that, that have almost too much education to know what is right and what is wrong you know like hmm. you, you confuse yourself with too much too many too many thoughts to and you can't even come to a, a, a legitimate conclusion yeah interesting because you know some of the smartest wisest people i know are are not people that you would think of as an intellectual hmm. although you know the, the every one of them is well read, if that makes yeah. sense. The, you know, le- the less formal education, I guess maybe that's what I'm, I'm really against. The less formal education, it seems like the the uh, more intelligent and, and more knowledgeable people are. Interesting. Strange. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've I've have not lived as long as you have, so I can't really really speak to to that idea. But I can see so how it shot, makes sense. Shot at me being old. Thanks. <laughs> I'm just saying I don't have as much experience as you, oh. is all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but then he goes on to describe how ide- ideology did sort of play into these these three big uh, politics that we're looking at. He says, in Nazism, this ideology was the division of the world into friends and enemies and the pursuit of eliminating Judaism from the face of the earth. And the connection between the Germans and the Italians was the enemy of international Bolshevism. Uh, but he says, the mash of rationalism in Soviet totalitarianism is is more difficult uh, because, you know, you'd think that the intellectualism of Marx would seem to be hostile to every aspect of fascism. Marxism, fascism, and Nazism all had this in common. And that was mass mobilization through a political party that held a monopoly of power, the cult of leadership, the destruction of all intermediate and non-state organizations, and their replacement by politicized parodies, and the replacement of rule by law, by arbitrary violence, and a regime based on terror. So you would think, you know, well, Marx wrote all this stuff. He's very intellectually grounded. You know, he he would be really in support of all these intellectual theories. He wouldn't be, you know, irrational in the sense that it's just ideology. Uh, but I think, you know, the Soviet Union is one of the biggest culprits of that, um, you know, at least equal to uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And and if you look at those factors that he, he uses, and it is very good uh, to look at those to define Nazism and fascism. <clears throat> and then I, I think we, we need to look at what people are doing in the United States today. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. You know, it's the same stuff. Yeah. So if you look at like the, you know, the Democratic Party, for instance, of course, so the Democrats would say this about Republicans. But if you look at, you know, they, they want a mon- monopoly on power. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want any dissent. They want you off social media. They, they had a cult of leadership, I think, with Obama. And I think and to some extent today it's with Biden. Yeah. I, it's just it's so weird that they don't even question him. And then they they want to destroy any sort of uh, non-state actors. They want the government to have their tentacles in everything. They don't want you to have any privacy. Mm-hmm. They, they, they're they're no longer um, advocates for you know Fourth Amendment um, objections. You know for search and seizure. 
and they want you know every time there's a holiday coming up uh they want to uh, have people you know try to espouse their political views to their uncle at uh you know thanksgiving mm-hmm. they, they want everything political they don't want any sort of p- privacy and they they have you know the, the 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 there's no safe havens even within your own family yeah and that's that's another uh, uh marker for this kind of fascism the nazism and then of course the arbitrary violence you're seeing that everywhere now now maybe it's just because it's on social media more but you know there's the antifa stuff uh which i think is is probably limited to certain areas where there's a high percentage of left-wing lunatics and college students but you have this this arbitrary uh, violence you know against uh, certain types of people mm-hmm. uh, in the street that that it, it just it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and so you you end up you know it seems like we're going to in that direction you know it's it's mm-hmm. not as bad it's not it's not systemic yet but they want it to be it seems yeah. to be and that's that's you know it's a worry that a lot of people have right now well i think one of the things that's like really often overlooked in terms of you know like you know people's rights you know we talk a lot about you know right to bear arms and you know right to to free speech but the right to like organization I think is really important. I think we're seeing that now, like you were mentioning, I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago with uh, sort of the soft despotism. Um, But, you know, once you get people, you know, sort of turning away from private organizations and charities and stuff that can help them and relying solely on the government, then it's, you know, then the government has to solve all our problems. You know, if you take away the ability for these private organizations to solve things, which are oftentimes more efficient than the government and more, you know, cost effective and things like that, you know, you're taking away, um, you know, just so much, there are so many good resources that are available to the people and you're limiting that that freedom to, you know, of organization, of, of getting together with other people and things like that, which I think is a really big thing to, to look out for. Yeah, and and there's something to be said about um, uh, the effectiveness of private charity that that the, the government can't manage under the current system. Because, like, for instance, uh, let's say somebody comes to, I'm not going to name the charity, some, a local charity uh, for... Um, uh, like utility assistance. Mm-hmm. One of the questions they ask are, well, do you have a, you know, uh, uh, do you have like a, a cable TV subscriber? You know, do, do you have that? Do you have all these, you know, do you have other monthly accounts like Pandora, Spotify, those types of things? And, and, and so, you know, they go through that sort of thing with them uh, to try to get them to understand that they need to be on a budget, you mm-hmm. know, and there's some things that are less important than paying your electric bills, you know, <laughs> streaming the free, you know, the, the, the premium streaming services and, you know, cable TV or, you know, satellite TV or whatever service you have uh, is not a priority, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, you, and you see that, you know, you have people that are uh, claiming to be desperately poor, but they have a huge TV. They have got all these streaming services They've, they've got all the gaming systems and all that kind of stuff, and they, they and they just waste all of their time doing all those things. So the government's not set up to have that, that kind of accountability. <clears throat> and uh, because, you know, it's just some bureaucrat that you either you either check off the boxes or you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you get all the little boxes, then then you get the stuff. And uh, and so it's a complete that that in and of itself is a complete waste of time and and money. And then you have to pay these people. So if you have a charitable organization, a lot of them are, are volunteers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, certainly uh, working for less money because they believe in the mission, that type of thing. But but then, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, if you eliminate all these different, you know, the, the primary charitable sources of uh, the kind of benevolent good in a community, then all you have is the government and then and the government can manipulate it. You yeah, know? exactly. I, I support and it's 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 a. It's an ongoing problem, and but you know the uh, upcoming financial crisis will cure all that because there won't be any money to to give away. That's uplifting. <laughs> that's that's really, really a fantastic thought. Um, but to turn back to the book a little bit, uh, he says that the term totalitarianism was mainly employed by Cold War commentators, uh, but this was criticized for importing a moral judgment that ma- Marxism and Nazism were indistinguishably disgusting. He says, here we look at the intellectual underpinnings, you know, how they're different from one another, uh, but we can also accept the brutal political activities of the Soviet Union, uh, Nazi Germany, and fascist Italy as facts. You know, we're looking at this sort of in retrospect now, and we can recognize, yeah, these were all terrible, terrible things. He says, however, fascism does present a difficulty in looking at the intellectual underpinnings of these theories, as there's largely a strong anti-intellectual rhetoric 
uh, and there's this idea uh, that, you know, uh, you know, there's this there's no real core doctrine in fascism. And fascist has become, again, as I mentioned earlier, such a term of abuse that describing someone as fascist is to, de is to decline to reason with them at all. You know, you're just a fascist. You have no no ideas. You have no ideology. You have no political underpinning. You're just espousing hate for, you know, the sake of, you know, espousing hate. Um, but really, that's not true as we look at these these theories from here on out. So from there, we move into everybody's favorite topic, uh, from Marxism to Stalinism, the sort of history of the Soviet Union and its, and its political theories here, which are just lovely. Um, and Vladimir Lenin is who we start off with, and he was the second son of a minor official. He was born in 1870, died in 1924 after being wounded by an assassin two years earlier. He became a revolutionary when his older brother had been executed in 1887 for a plot to kill Alexander III. And by 1895, he was a fluent Marxist and was exiled in 1902, and did not return for good until 1917, when he was allowed safe passage into Russia by German authorities who thought that he would undermine the Russian war effort. Uh, and this was true because he was decisive in bringing about revolution, and so his leadership established the Soviet Union after these revolutions. And Lenin's great invention was the idea of a revolutionary party. He believed that Russia could take the lead in overthrowing capitalism by breaking the weakest link in the capitalist chain, and he thought he saw an advanced revolutionary consciousness in Russia and believed that revolution in Russia would begin as a bourgeois revolution, which would try to create a constitutional republic, but pressure from the left would turn this to a socialist revolution. However, the socialist revolution really occurred when Lenin acquired power in 1917, and it became uh, clear that this revolution wouldn't spread. And so Lenin had to give up this Marxist doctrine of an international socialism. Uh, and so the reason that Lenin was so successful was the doctrine of the party. And this was the idea that revolutionary activists had to form a party capable of uniting workers and peasants, and the party had to adopt democratic centralism, where leaders uh, were democratically elected, but the policy was devised at the center, and all members must follow it. So the party was the vanguard, agitating and propagandizing, waiting for the moment to lead an actual revolution. So that's really how the Soviet Union managed to function, was this supremely powerful one-party state, which I think is one of the, the most dangerous sort of branches of Marxism here. Um, I'm sure you have some thoughts on, on everything that I just described there. Well, I mean, it, it, the question is whether it's inev inevitable. You know, mm -hmm. when you're going to go down the path of Marxism, is it inevitable that you have um, a Stalin, a Lenin, a Stalin, a Chairman Mao, uh, you know, a Pol Pot? Uh, is, is, is there any other way to do it? Um, and I think the answer is no, because mm -hmm. the whole idea is that the, the – that, um, the way they have espoused it, especially through Lenin, was you have this revolutionary party, which is always at – there's always a revolution. And mm -hmm. there's, always, there's always renewal through murder, really, uh, and, and because if, if you have to have the intellectual purity um, yeah. be revitalized from time to time um, you know, through the, the blood of your adversaries. And, and so it, it – you know, it, it's hard hard to know how much Lenin believed his own BS. You know, or if or if, or if he was, you know, I, I suspect he he just wanted power and he was a, a bad person, and he wanted to be that totalitarian person that uh, would control the entire mm -hmm. country. And he saw his opportunity to, to to have the revolution and, and to seize power, but perhaps you know he believed in some of this Marxist stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you when, anytime you set up a system where you have more and more like concentric circles, you know, like the, there's a guy at the top who's in charge of the committee and the committee's in charge of the, uh, the districts and the districts are in charge of the people they're in, you know, it, it's good. That's, that's the only, that's the only thing to happen mm -hmm. because yeah. if you don't do it, then the guy next to you in that committee is going to kill you and he's going to do it. <laughs> there's Stalin, you know, and, and, and Stalin, man, he's a, he was just cold blooded murder, yeah. he, murder before he even got into the communist mm -hmm. party. But uh, he was another opportunist kind of going through that that system. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the the phrase like, you know, well, that's not true communism is like thrown around so often because, you know, when you point out, you know, communist China, you know, Soviet Russia, you know, some of the most awful, horrible regimes of all time, you know, those are products of communism. But then you'll have the communist supporters be like, well, well, that's not that's not real communism. And sure, it's not, quote unquote, real communism, as in these specific actions were not described explicitly by Karl Marx. But it's like you have to, you know reason that this is just the practical, you know, sort of elaboration of these ideas. If you advocate for a system in which one person has to take control and then eventually out of their own goodwill, 
they're going to sort of spread all the, the resources out to the people. That's just not going to happen. You have to recognize that once you put these people in charge of literally everything in a country, you know, that's going to lead to some awful things, some really, really horrible things. You know, the, the author makes a good point. He, he mentions that all you, utopian creeds contain mm-hmm. totalitarian germ. And that's at the core of it. That's the core of, of Plato. I mean, every every philosopher that has a utilitarian dream of the world, uh, or utopian, I'm sorry, utopian dream of the world, um, ha- has some elements of totalitarianism because you cannot, it can, because it becomes, uh, you can't have dissent. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a, a utopia, you can't have people saying, this is not a utopia. It could be better. You know, because then it's, you you know, that person is dissenting. And so you have to knock those people out mm-hmm. as either, you know, uh, nuts or bums or um, heretics. And, yeah. uh, and that's that's really what it is. I mean, it's, uh, Marxism is just a different form of a religion. Mm-hmm. She gets into, I think, in this this part of the chapter. Anyway. Yeah. I have a note about that, you know, it's sort of grouped in with, with religious doctrines. And on the, the utopian idea, I have this, this quote I underlined here. He says, as part of a practical project, utopian ideals present dangers. One is that people in possession of a total solution will be unwilling to see their designs modified or to tolerate dissent about the plausibility of the utopian vision. Their attitude to dissenters may turn savage. Dissenters are sinning against the light and are therefore either preternaturally wicked or deeply mad, and in either case, subhuman. Shoot the mad dogs was the injunction of the prosecutors at the Moscow show trials of the 1930s. The purges had an obvious and much remarked precursor and Robespierre's Republic of Virtues. This idea, you know, we are we are providing this perfect life for you. And if you don't agree with this perfect life, you're obviously crazy or you're obviously, you know, stupid. And so, you know, you're no use to us. Get out, die, be exiled, whatever. You know, you're not part of our perfect union anymore. Yeah, that's that's what they all are. You Mm -hmm. know, and, and it's just the nature of it. And yeah. so, and, and it's not so different uh, from Nazism. Mm-hmm. You had to believe in the, the the Nazi Party. The Nazi Party always had the right answer. You know what's what's the difference between that and the Communists? You know, yeah. the Communist Party has their only the right answer. And um, you know, and, and of course, there's always um, the deception involved in that, and the lies, and that you have you're you're forced to participate in the lies, mm-hmm. uh, forced to participate in the. Uh, uh, the the changing of the definition of words, you yeah. Know, the, the the words become inconvenient, um, you know. Or, or you say, well, what is you know, like that's not the truth. Well, then they have to define, they have to redefine the word truth, hmm. because if they don't redefine the word truth, then there's an objection to their yeah. system. You know, it, it, it's it's what we're seeing in, in you know over and over again. It's just it's a, it's just a repeat of the Soviet show trials, the so- Soviet um you know um uh, lies and the changing of language back in the 1930s we're just seeing it again you know uh, you know not as bad yet mm-hmm. uh but you know they want it to be that bad i think yeah you know the people i agree that, that 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 if you if you know if you object to some dude wearing a skirt uh that that's that's the dude wearing a skirt and not some woman um you know then then it's the, then you're a her- you're a heretic yeah. I mean, the, the the way that they react to somebody saying, you know, I'm pretty sure that's a dude in a, in a dress, um, is is like is is, well, you, you know, it, you you really need to see the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm. You have to see uh, when you're home on spring break because you'll understand my reference to it. Uh, because really their reaction is what those you'll you'll just don't know anybody who, who's seen the movie will say, oh yeah. Uh, uh, Donald Sutherland sc- sc- screeching at you and pointing. <laughs> I guess we'll have to check that who, out. Who, uh, interestingly, is the you know the main bad guy in the Hunger Games, which is uh, also oh. my, one of my favorite dystopian movies, um, because uh, you know Capital City is Washington D.C., New York, mm-hmm. and um, and us people out here in Missouri are District Twelve or Thirteen or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no like, kidding. Uh, you know we're doing all, we're doing all the work out here and the, those knuckleheads are you know anyway <laughs> i digress let's move yes. on back to the book he, he goes on and talks about how marxism is in tension with itself which is an interesting point he says marxism demands deep respect for the intransigence of things but also a deep confidence in the ability of the radicals 
uh, the radicalized working class to change things. So it's this idea that, you know, everything has been the same throughout history, but also these few people have the power to change everything about history. And it's like, you know, how do, how do you reconcile those two ideas? Um, and so Lenin tried to modify this idea um, and, and all of his modifications emphasize the role of the will and the need to force history to move at a faster pace. And this clashed with the actuality of the overwhelmingly illiterate and agrarian Russian society. He says, a vanguardist party, an emphasis on the will, and a determination to achieve in a backward, semi-literate country what Marx had envisioned happening in the most developing countries in the world is a recipe for a head-on conflict between an aggressive leadership and a reluctant rank and file. And so once you do have this conflict, of course, you need the secret police. And the secret police was used to stop or sort of eliminate this conflict before it started. And this was inherited from Tsarist Russia, but was uh, more uh, you know, nasty, more efficient, and more pervasive in Soviet Russia. It says revolution revolutionaries could have no qualms about employing uh, you know brutal terror to preserve the revolution the monolithic party backed by the secret police then fell into stalin's hands um you know got to love stalin and just to wrap up this section here he says stalinist autoc uh, autocracy became very theological stalin's role was papal in that his ideas were infallible and nobody could argue against him it says lenin had sown the seed for this with there uh, being no room for freedom of speech at all for the sake of preserving party unity uh, and so this combination of Soviet influences and theology of Marxism, Leninism, and Stalinism gave all communist regimes a distinctive totalitarian character uh, based on sort of this theological Marxist idea. Um, so really, really just awful, horrible stuff here uh, and how these regimes were set up and how they were run, um, just completely suppressing any dissent because, you know, it was a religion. I think there's there's very little denying just how religious Marxism really became or if it was very even religious from the get-go, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Yep. Yeah, and and uh, w what's chilling about it is that they they were um, keeping so many detailed records on people, mm -hmm. and, and they were doing it pretty effectively, and this was all before, before computers. You yeah. know, I mean, the, the Soviet Union uh, disbanded, essentially fell apart in, what, 1989, Mm -hmm. And I said, there were computers, but but the Soviet Union was way behind us. And in 89, it, there was really no internet, you know, like we yeah. have today. There's no social media. There's no Google. There's no um, Facebook and all that stuff. <clears throat> um, and so that's the really scary thing is if you have a modern um, uh, uh, a country that's totalitarian with the current uh, ability to document and to score every individual person mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what china is trying to do but they have so many people yeah uh, i think i think they're a little bit overwhelmed with the data but they're really trying hard <laughs> hmm. and and you see those guys at the um econo the davos you know world economic forum uh advocating the same type of thing and mm -hmm. people haven't been paying attention to davos i've been reading about davos for i don't know 15 years more than that I remember reading uh, about it back my, when I was still at the old job. Uh, National Review, when it used to be a conservative magazine, would send a correspondence there to, to um, basically make fun, report on and make fun of them. Um, you know, all these people meeting in Davos. It's been around since the 1970s. Really? Uh, yeah, they've been, they've been systematically trying to uh, get their people in positions of power like Justin Trudeau and, mm -hmm. and others. Yeah. Uh, and they've, they've done a very good job of, of of getting people in positions of leadership, and especially within the bureaucracy, um, to try to implement this type of um, slow-moving totalitarian mm -hmm. And it's a it's a it's a it's a problem. But but you know it's inevitable if 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 you give them enough power, this is what you're going to end up with. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about the World Economic Forum, this is, I guess, a not so fun fact, um, but with all these, you know, tech CEOs and politicians and everything coming to Davos, uh, there's one other group of people that uh, absolutely flocks to Davos, and that is all of the prostitutes in the surrounding area, um, because all of these, you know, horribly depraved people just, you know, sort of demand this, I guess. There's a very big market uh, for that profession in Davos uh, during the World Economic Forum. And, and I think that's a tremendous opportunity uh, for people that really want to bring this that organization down, mm. uh, because prostitutes tend to be people that will do things for money, and, <laughs> and, if, and if you pay them enough money, uh, they could uh, get a lot of these people in very compromising positions. Mm. Which I, I think there's a lot of that going on already. 
you know, I yeah. don't know it, but you know, you get all these depraved individuals um, in, in today's day and age with with how you can videotape and, and monitor people. I can't imagine there's not a lot of that going on with a lot mm-hmm. of our leadership uh, doing yeah. all sorts of crazy stuff. But then again, you got Hunter Biden out there who's <laughs> had a laptop full of videos of him smoking crack and and uh, doing whatever with uh, prostitutes, literally mm-hmm. on video. He videotaped himself doing stuff. And nobody cares. We elected yep. his dad president. He's, you know, and he's got all these details about how he's given Joe Biden ten percent of the ill-gotten gains from their schemes and stuff. Maybe it doesn't yeah. matter. I don't know. Well, you had the Epstein and his whole list. Yeah, it's like how do you, how did how does that gal get convicted of uh, of um, mm-hmm. uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, the sex trade. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, engaging in that that exchange when she's neither party you know mm-hmm. she's bringing underage women to these guys presumably men but then there's nobody identified as the customer how, how yeah. is that even possible how can I think that I, be a crime yeah there was a um i think it was a babylon b headline but it was you know Ghislaine maxwell becomes the first person uh you know tried for trafficking children to nobody yeah, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. You know, you, you, you have this crime, but to who? And of course, they won't ever reveal reveal the list. So I stand corrected. It doesn't really matter. Whatever they do, they can do. They're they are all powerful, all knowing, and untouchable. Yes, that's lovely. On that uplifting note, uh, we're moving into fascism and violence here. And he says that the origins of fascism are very much disputed. Uh, there were several decisive elements that came together in the late 19th century to form fascism's base, and these were racism, nationalism, irrationalism, and anti-liberalism. So as these components can come together in other political visions. Uh, you can have, you know, imperialism that is both racist and liberal. You can have a very liberal nationalism as well. Uh, but really, in this sort of combination, they they sort of form this this evil, um, you know, ideology that is fascism. And then he goes on to talk about. Can, uh, I wonder if you can have. I mean, I know it would be different, but I wonder if you can have fascism without the anti-Semitism and the racism. You know, I mean, is is that what is that? What mm-hmm. what is what is fascism without the racism and the yeah. anti-Semitism? I mean, I is think that... he does bring up that point a little later because I mean, he points out Mussolini really didn't have any anti-Semitic uh, you know policies until he was pressured by Hitler. Um, right. You know, so I think it was possible to set up that sort of system. But, you know, once you have, you know, one fascist, you know, society and another fascist society, which both claim, you know, we're sort of the, the superior people for this land, then I think it does naturally sort of fall into racism. Um, but I think it, it might be possible to to have it without racism, so long as it's not, you know, we are the people of this country by our blood um, and by, you know, you know, our, our DNA and more so just we are the people of this country and nobody can take it from us because we are the people of this land, I think. But yeah. it'd be hard to do, I think. It'd be very hard to to keep yeah, it from the, from falling into racism. Yeah, the, the blood and the soil stuff where it's the people of this land, I guess, has to be racist. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just like in the United States, it's like whoever's a citizen yeah. um, is, a, is an American. Mm-hmm. It's, there can't be races. There, there could be a chauvinism, uh, an us versus them, which which I uh, I ascribe. I, I follow that that, that I, I have a preference for American citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. and, think, and of course, I think all of our elected officials should uh, uh, specifically state that mm-hmm. that they are representing citizens above all, all other interested parties. Um. But that's not a racism because, gosh, you know, you know how diverse our country is. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I, I guess, I guess the big thing is, is you have to have, for it to be a fascist, you have to have that that sort of nationalism that's based upon who's already here, and you're keeping mm-hmm. anybody else that's that's not like us out. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's because so many of them, so many of these fascist doctrines fall back on on heritage and history. You know, we yeah. we are the people of this country because, you know, our descendants were here. We are directly blood related to them. You know, fascist Italy claimed that they were the revival of the Roman Empire, you know, based right. on that exact reason. It's because we are the descendants of Rome and we have the right to this and blah, 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 blah. Nobody else can be here besides us and that sort of idea. And I guess that that's the key. You have to have a pretty homo- homogenous mm-hmm. population to begin with. Yeah. You know, I guess that's really what you that has to be the starting point for fascism. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yeah, so, so I think it's hard for, you know, any claim, you know, that any party in America is really, truly fascist, you know, even though people like to throw that word around because, you know, 
the Americans weren't here forever, you know, besides, I guess, really the, the Native Americans. But I don't think you really see them, you know, supporting any sort of fascist. Well, I guess not really. There's no really sort of big fascist movement, um, although I do see not a, not a big movement of Native Americans, period. Yes, that's true. <laughs> That's true. But if it's, you know, it'd be very hard to sort of reconcile that idea of, well, you know, you weren't even here first. So, you know, it'd be very hard to say we are the the righteous people of the land because we are descendant from the righteous, you know, people. Although I think, you know, I guess you you can have like, you know, like there's there's people that are, well, of course, it's benign. You know, people are very proud that they're like, what do they call it? A hundred hundred year farm or 200 year farm. It's been Mm -hmm. the family for so many years, so many generations. I guess you, you you can come from that, but it's I, I just don't see anybody doing that. Anyway, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't went down a d- different sidetrack. That's there. all right. We're now moving on to violence. Uh, he says these these ingredients really only acquire their fascist quality when united by a movement that is animated by violence. And this is often linked to the irrationalism of fascist writers. Uh, the discovery of deep irrationalism in the human psyche, really kind of according to Freud, there led many to turn to fascism as a relief from self-control and an outlet for the innate aggression of mankind. You know, all of, the, all of these theories coming up saying, you know, people are, you know, innately aggressive. You know, you have a lot of people saying, okay, let's let's release this innate regression. Let's, you know, fight violently for this, this right that we have. Uh, but he says, it's harder to remember now the rational attraction for fascism and communism in the 1930s. I'll read just a section from the book here. So since 1950 and 1940, respectively, Western Europe and the United States have, by historical standards, been astonishingly well-ordered and prosperous. Almost nobody thinks the existing social and economic order is so broken that orthodox political means cannot fix it. In the 1930s, when unemployment in the United States was running at 25%, the economic system seemed broken beyond repair. In Central and Eastern Europe, things were worse. You know, it's, it's really important to consider, you know, and kind of compare these things. You know, things were not looking good. And so it does make a lot more rational sense for these people to rise up and say, let's destroy our entire political system. Let's destroy our entire economic system and just start all over. You know, we have so much unemployment. Our, our institutions are corrupt and awful. Let's just start over. So, you know, kind of looking at it from that perspective, there is, you know, a rational attraction there. Yeah. Well, if we have a financial crash, we're gonna we're gonna have struggle with the same tendencies because mm-hmm. we're we all, we all know our political system is corrupt. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody that that you know because you have the left wingers saying you know the 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 corrupt Republicans and they, the you know now the Republicans are like the entire Congress is corrupt, mm-hmm. and uh, you know so 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 if you have a financial crisis, on uh, with that as the foundation, we're in trouble. Yeah, you know, this country's in trouble if we have a, a big crash, but. But yeah, that I guess the, I guess I guess there's not a whole. I guess if it's a benign nationalism and chauvinism, then it's not fascism. So if you have a, you can you can have a small country in Europe mm-hmm. that is chauvinistic. I mean, a lot of the laws in a lot of the European countries were uh, before they started joining up in the the the, the union. Uh, they, they you know they had definitely preferences to for their their peoples. Yeah. Uh, but I guess as long as they don't try to murder the others, it's not really fascism. It's just a single party rule and they like themselves best. Yes. <laughs> right, fair enough. I suppose so. Um, we then move on to racism, nationalism, and anti-liberalism. He says, racism in some form has been one of the standing you know, infirmities of the human r- mind. Uh, but the, the role that racism played uh, a large part in interior fascism had two sources. Uh, the first was the encounters with the pre-industrial societies, you know, sort of from the, the European expansion, and also a much older tradition of anti-Semitism. He then talks about Hitler a little bit, um, in that he got his racial theory from Houston Stuart Chamberlain. And this is the idea that the pure Aryan people stood at the peak of a racial hierarchy, and that intermarriage is fatal to a, uh, to a race, and that only the expulsion of the Jews from Europe could save European world dominance. You know, a very natural conclusion there, you know, whatever it is, the problem, whatever the problem is, the solution is getting rid of the Jews, Um, as everybody throughout history has always said. Um, But he says, you know, German anti-Semitism, you know, even went back to pogroms and mass murder at the time of the First Crusade. Um, This was later influenced by Russian exterminism, um, which was the much more aggressive belief that, you know, not just kick them out, not just, you know, um, you know, move them out of our country, but literally kill all of the Jews. Um, and so that's really where that idea kind of came from there was from Russia. Um, but he says, however, fascism could exist without the racial components. As I mentioned earlier, Mussolini only adopted the anti-Semitic policies as a concession to pressure from Hitler. Um, so this idea that, you know, 
the the Aryans are the the supreme race, and that the only solution is to to kill all of the Jews was was a mix of a few different things. It wasn't you know just Hitler that just started this idea from nowhere. I think a lot right. of people forget that. Well, yeah, and, and Hitler was supported by the German people. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, 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 this was not like everybody's like, oh, Hitler was a uniquely, a uniquely bad person that that asserted himself in this country. Mm-hmm. Well, he might have been a uniquely bad person, but he was he was he was not out of the mainstream. You know, I mean, the the, the people went, were were uh, very excited about what he was saying. Yeah, and how he was able to maintain power um, after he. You know, he he had a certain tactical decisions he made early on to wipe out the the opponents, including the Marxist and the communists, and then people within his own party to mm-hmm. really uh, seize more total control. But yeah, very okay. true. Moving along, <laughs> he says also important were the blood was the blood and soil movement of the 1880s onward. And the most articulate writers of this was Charles Maras and Maurice Barre. Says Barre was responsible for the redefinition of French nationalism as a conservative anti-revolutionary ideal. Barre was born in 1862 and died in 1923, but Charles Maras was born six years later and lived through the conflicts of the 1930s and was a propagandist for Patan during the period of the Vichy government. Says Barre was a Catholic anti-royalist, while Maras was an anti-Catholic supporter of decentralized monarchy, but both agreed on a passion for one people living in one nation of their own. Again, what we were talking about earlier, you know, we are of this race and we belong to this soil um, because, you know, it is from our ancestors and we must defend it very, very strongly, even though they sort of manifested that idea in two very different directions, but it was all rooted on that one principle. Did, did like, every bad idea come from France? I mean, this <laughs> <laughs> is like, oh my gosh. You know, you know, Robespierre, you know, all these other men. Mm-hmm. Like, golly. You know, it's, it's, there, there's something about France that that, uh, that that they come up with these horrific ideas. Yeah. They're like, hey, I have a good idea. What? <laughs> uh, <laughs> For such an awful country, they're very devoted to, you know, killing everybody who is not part of this awful country. <laughs> it's, it's so astounding. I don't know how they keep doing this. <laughs> well, they're a bunch of intellectuals. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, he then goes on to explain how this anti-liberalism uh, came to be about. And he says, fascist and nationalist had a clear, clear target, and this was liberalism. It says the liberal state de- derived uh, legitimacy from the fact that it protected the rights of individuals who were its citizens. Their rights to protection were prior to its rights to their allegiance. You know, what comes first, the, the people or the nation? And of course, all the fascists and the nationalists are like, well, the people should serve the nation first. That should be the first priority. You know, you have to, you know, pledge allegiance to this nation. Um, and then maybe later after that, once the nation is successful, you can get some of your rights. Um, where on the other hand, liberalism was like, no, the rights are fundamentally most important. And then from there, we can actually build a nation. So sort of backwards approaches, you know, which is more important there. We then move on to discussing irrationalism a little bit more. Uh, he says, uh, he talks about Sorel there uh, very, very much. He says, Sorel was very influential in irrationalism. He was born in 1847 and died in 1922. And he spent his working life in the French Public Works Authority and only became a political theorist in retirement. He began as, a, as an orthodox mar- uh, Marxist, but later embraced many anti-bourgeoisie and anti-democratic creeds. And his hatred of capitalism stem- stemmed from the destruction of the instinct of craftsmanship which was interesting. He hated industrial society, wanted, you know, the more handcrafted things uh, to be sort of the basis of the economy, which is an interesting idea. Um, yeah. And I don't necessarily hate entirely. You know, I think, you know, a lot of the, the cheap crap that we have today is exactly that cheap crap and we should have more hand produced things. But, you know, wiping out the whole capitalist system is not the the solution. Um, and he says the only way to restore craft, uh, the, the craft ideal was by the workers movement committing itself to the myth of the sudden, violent and comprehensive overthrow of the capitalist order. He insisted that this must happen in times of prosperity, but the key emphasis there on this idea of myth-making, uh, because he saw Marxism as a not fully drawn blueprint, and he praised Marx's ability to inspire, you know, emotional longings and passion for action, and Sorel sent out, uh, set out to also inspire action, wanting a terminal conflict to restore craftsmanship, and this appealed to Mussolini very aesthetically, as fascist political theory was centered around a corporate state. Uh, and so to talk about that corporate state, uh, he says there are two major theorists of Italian fascism, and these were Alfredo Rocco and Giovanni Gentile. Uh, and they, you know, sort of uh, the, the core of their fascist doctrine was a series of mirror images of 19th century liberalism uh, that fascism was intended to replace. This is Gentile, Gentile 
uh, you know, belief that fascism really offered true freedom. And that's the only way to get to your true freedom. He says, liberal individualism frustrated the human desire to be at one with our fellows in collective undertakings to which we can give wholehearted moral allegiances. The citizens were alienated from the corrupt, self-serving, and non-transparent political system. This is needed where the institutions that would restore social cohesion, turning self-seeking, uh, turn self-seeking into public service and ensure that only a heroic leader was head of state and that the leading figures in society were genuinely an elite. As, the total- as to the totalitarian quality of fascism, Gentile boasted of it. Fascism was a spiritual doctrine embracing the totality of social life. So here we see very, very explicitly uh, this belief that, you know, this is a religious doctrine. You know, this is the, the one moral way. You know, of course, Sorel is pointing to Marx and then these other later Italian writers are like, yeah, this is this is correct. You know, it needs to be a theological religious approach to everything, which, I mean, we've talked about time and time again on this podcast. Yeah, you need, and you need to uh, to have less freedom in order to get freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you need more governmental control to limit your choices so that you have the freedom of choice within those limitations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very roundabout way of looking at freedom. Right. And that's similar to what a lot of people think about free speech now. They think that yeah. uh, you need to limit speech in, in order to have free speech because it's not free if if you if every time you talk somebody uh you know uh insults you and hurts mm-hmm. your feelings and such. <laughs> Very true. Uh he then talks about corporatism and you know, sort of the central question of, you know, what is the difference between liberal corporatism from fascism? You know, if M- Mussolini wanted to set up this whole series of, you know, corporate rulers and everything sort of, you know, essentially based like a corporation. You know, what's the difference between that and liberal corporatism? And he makes an Not interesting point here. Yeah. Not a whole lot. Mm-hmm. If they're all in agreement, they all went to the same schools and they all have the same agenda. You can have fascism through corporativism. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to have, everybody has to be in the same playbook. Mm-hmm. And, then, and you, you delegate the authority uh, of these corporate boards, um, you know, to, to run their various businesses, but it, it could be without even be state controlled, you can still have the same agenda. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, well, he points out uh, that Roosevelt's New Deal was not unlike fascism. Uh, he says the, the boards and administrations proliferated at essentially their control over very minute things, which is exactly what Mussolini wanted. And there was a similar goal for self-sufficiency. Of course, this was motivated more so by the Great Depression and economic decline rather than, you know, pure racism. But they do still have this idea that, you know, we need to be separated from the world and we need to set up all of these boards and administrations to, you know, manage everything, literally everything uh, just about. Uh, But he says, you know, what separates Soviet and fascist totalitarianisms uh, was their shared uh, idea of the one party states. You know, what made the New Deal not necessarily totalitarian totalitarian is that we still do have a multi-party system or a two-party system you know it's not just one group of people making all of the decisions all of the time at least on the surface you know who knows what the the world economic forum is doing like we mentioned earlier well and and, and i don't know that that wasn't the goal you know yeah. of new deal um to to crush the opposition and to have a single party state and, mm. and really right now uh, i mean it's my view that for the most part we have there's a unit party Mm. Um, you know, there's a majority of Republicans and Democrats that, that agree on a whole lot of key issues, not least of which is the, the current fad of supporting Ukraine yeah. uh, for whatever reason. They're not an ally of us. That they're, they're not, There's no treaty with them. Mm-hmm. Um, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars arming them against somebody who's also not an ally of ours. You know, I, I understand why Europe would be all over it. Mm-hmm. But why the hell do we care? I don't know. But but the Republicans and Democrats, they're all in agreement yeah. you know, for a minority uh, of the Republican members um, squawking about it. The Uniparty is in favor of it. Yeah, very true. Uniparty opposed Trump. You know, Uniparty yeah. is going to going to do what they're going to do. So Yeah. Uh, he then kind of, you know, goes back to Gentile a little bit. And he says, Gentile's nationalism rested within a blood and soil manifestation of the state that confronted the individual. He also had this sort of uh, idea of an up, down, up idea of authority in that, you know, authority does stem from the people. Then it goes up to the government and the government puts it back down directly onto the people. And you have this idea that force and consent are inseparable as the basis of the state. You know, you know, if you're forced to do something, you're really just consenting to it because you gave them the authority in the first place is his reasoning, which is entirely cyclical and, you know, doesn't hold hold much water, in my opinion. But, you know, it's 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 a strong legal theory. Uh, in the United States, you know, when mm-hmm. we 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 elect representatives to do things, and and quite often they're like, 
well, this is this is the authority you've given me, so it's it's part of the democratic system. Mm-hmm. So get in line. Yeah, very true. There's there's, there's some logic behind it. Mm-hmm. We then move on to Nazism, uh, everybody's we favorite. That. Why is it? I mean, this this chapter is so repetitive <laughs> to me. We've already it was pretty about repetitive. Nazism. Now it's Nazism again, and then it's soft totalitarianism. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm frustrated with this chapter. Yes, I have a I few know. brief notes on Nazism. That I'll... Skip this. Go, go. Just do it because we already <laughs> talked about it. It says Nazism was almost a wholly unintellectual enterprise and that anti-Semitism was an essential component that was not present in Stalinism or fascism. And what united the three was the division of the world into friends and enemies. And here he brings up Carl Schmitt, who was born in 1888 and died in 1985, was one of the few intellectuals to side with Nazis. He says they put into practice his ideas uh, that he had uh, that in every regime there must be a dictatorial element, uh, that a charismatic leader was a truer representative of the people than any parliamentary regime, and that all authority as the element of the transcendentals. This idea essentially that you need one big charismatic ruler who will be the true voice of the people and that the Nazis really were the the most prominent, especially at the time, to really espouse this idea. And so Carl Schmitt uh, sided with the Nazis for for some time there. We then move on to soft totalitarianism. I hope my my summary of of Nazism was was brief enough for you. Um, Uh, he, says that, Let's move on. he says that the Second World War was hailed as a victory of liberal democracy over fascism, but that was not entirely true. As we mentioned earlier, uh, Stalin's regime was just as brutal as Hitler's and had used genocide as policy even earlier than Hitler's regime. And was well, a more... so, 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 I have a bone to pick with the author on this. Mm-hmm. Stalin was on Hitler's side at the beginning, and he doesn't even mention that. Yeah, uh, Stalin, w- w- we were allied with Stalin out of convenience. And that's mm-hmm. it. We knew he was a son of a bitch. Uh, and, and he was on Hitler's side to begin with, with a non-aggression pact, and they were going to divide up the world, all right? Mm-hmm. But when he attacked Stalin, we figured, fine, well, we're going to give this guy trucks and, and munitions and all that kind of stuff, and he's going to throw hundreds of thousands of, of his army uh, against the, the Germans, and he's going to aid in our war effort to defeat the Germans. So mm-hmm. we, we held our nose, and we we went with it. Yeah, But, you know, people is is prominent as George Patton wanted to turn the, the you know, the, the Germans and, and keep them armed and have them march with us against the, the Russians <laughs> at the end of the war. That's why he got fired but, uh, because everybody else was tired of war. Patton mm-hmm. just wanted war forever. But um, but he, he glosses, the author glosses over that as if as if they were always on our side. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Soviets were not on our side. They were on the other side, at best neutral. But he had a, they had a pact with Hitler. Yeah. It was only because Hitler got greedy, and when really he thought, with all the Soviet purges, that he would be it would be a cakewalk, mm-hmm. and, and um, kind of like people are thinking it's going to be a cakewalk to take on Russia even today, but the topography and it's just a vast expanse of it, mm-hmm. and the number of people there, and, and they they're they're a very hardy people because they live in in abject misery <laughs> their entire <laughs> lives. And I was like. You know, if, if an army comes at them, they're like, uh, you know, that's Tuesday. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not, so, you know, they, they will just pick up a rifle. This, you know, uh, I mean, that's overgeneralization. But in any event, um, that's my that's my rant about the author on, on this is if is if it was not a struggle between uh, between fascism and in, in, in a way Marxism as well mm-hmm. and the West. And then we just kind of allowed him to mm-hmm. to join our struggle because hitler was the more pressing uh problem at the yeah. time but you know the, the churchill and roosevelt both knew that after mm-hmm. the war they're gonna have to do something they're gonna have to deal with stalin and the soviets i mean they knew it mm-hmm. but it was a struggle between mainly the liberal democracies yeah. and fat yeah, I, th- I think that is forgotten by by a lot of people too. Uh, in seeing, you know, the Soviet Union was was good in World War II because they fought the Nazis. You know, the the much maligned Students for Communism Club on campus, who I've talked about before, uh, they they posted like a birthday celebration post uh, for you know Joseph Stalin. You know, as you do the the horrible dictator. Um, they said, you know, happy birthday to the to the big Nazi killer himself. You know, Joseph Stalin. You know, completely ignoring the point that you just made that he was on Hitler's side at the beginning. And only, you know, agreed to fight him for his own convenience, for his own gains, I think, really, because, well, I guess the Nazis turned on him first, right? Oh, yeah. 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 They, they, they they almost, 
uh, yeah, that's because they marched almost all the way to Moscow. Yeah, all the way to Moscow. And then uh, Leningrad, I mean, that there's a siege of uh, Leningrad. I mean, they went deep mm -hmm. into Russia and they almost got them. I mean, yeah. it was a matter of a couple of weeks. They, 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 and that would have really been devastating to the war effort because then he would have secured his, that flank because he, they still had to worry about Stalin doing breaking the pact and attacking them. Mm -hmm. So they had resources defending that uh, what would be their uh, eastern front uh, and they wanted to wipe out Stalin and the Soviet as a, as a potential uh, rival because they thought they could do it in a blitzkrieg like they did with Poland, et cetera, et cetera, in France. And then they could focus all the resources on completing the mission in the, in the, in the West and, and knocking out the rest of Fran France, you know, the Vichy government or whatever. No, they already had the Vichy government and then mm -hmm. finally get in Great Britain because Great Britain was the only thing left. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, America it's across the ocean, but if they, mm -hmm. they were very close and, 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 um, and, and, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's also a good thing to note that the United States was um, was not exactly honest about Stalin to the American people mm -hmm. uh, during that time. You know, at first there was a non-aggression pact and, and there was not very good press. But then once they were attacked, it's like, oh, the Soviet army and the, you know, the Red Army is so wonderful and they're our allies. And, and, and there's an official line coming out of everywhere uh, as if they were great. And mm -hmm. um, of course, there are a lot of communist sympathizers within FDR's administration. Yeah. McCarthy was mostly right about all the mm -hmm. communist State Department. Um, he was just a jerk and an alcoholic and all that kind of stuff. And he got carried away. <laughs> Very true. Anyway. Uh, with it, yes. Moving on to the last few points in this chapter, which I thought were, were almost the most interesting. Uh, he yes. says, post-1945, there was a revival of interest in soft totalitarianism, but there were some earlier elements that were present in this. And he points out Afghani ya, uh, Zamyatin's We, uh, a novel that was published in 1940, uh, 1924 and was a dystopian novel in which the one state has almost extinguished individuality and indeed all of its subjects think, uh, or induced all of its subjects to think as one. But the danger that faces this society is sexual attraction. And the problem that this faces is because, you know, love gives a, a person a very strong sense of individual identity. And that's very dangerous to this, you know, horrible, uh, you know, one mind, essentially, uh, government. And then the other uh, novel that he points out is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which goes even farther. It says management of the world is full of genetically manipulated and conditioned individuals who hold off revolt in a variety of ways. I'm going to read here on page 943. It says it is a utopia in which the tormenting questions asked by the great novelists and playwrights have been suppressed for the sake of instant gratification. The romantic agony of unrequited love has been removed by constantly available sex. Even death has no terrors when a euthanasia comes at just the moment we are bored with life. If we get unhappy and restless, as children must sometimes do, a quick puff of soma blown over us will restore us to good humor. One of the work's anti-heroes, the controller for Europe, Mustafa Mond, knows that we have given up things that are worth having and that he is rumored not to have given up himself, such as Shakespeare in the Bible and Ford knows what. Like Bertrand Russell in some moods, he thinks it is a good bargain for everyone else. Um, mm -hmm. So this this horrible society, which is totally fictional and could never, never come to exist, uh, that is based on, you know, rampant, you know, drug use and, you know, uh, a, a group of people that is wholly of one agreement about everything, uh, you know, kind of suppressing people's, you know, attitudes because of the the freedom uh, of, of sex and all of these physical pleasures, you know, that, that could never happen. Uh, it'll never be true. We'll never live in that world because it's a dystopian and it's a novel uh, mm -hmm. and it'll never happen. Getting closer every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he says the, the anxiety in the 1950s and the 1960s was that we had collectively created a consensus on what any normal, rational, sensible person might be, do, and want, more so by commercial advertising than by indoctrination. He says this idea was articulated by David Reisman and was a picture of a society that exercises total control without a one-party state, secret police, or leadership cult, or terror. Um, so this idea that, you know, you're, we're all just sort of collectively agreeing there's there's one group of people that just agree, you know, this is what a person should be. And if you deviate from that norm, you know, you are wrong and you are morally in, in, incorrect and all of these sorts of things. And again, you know, that idea could never happen. You know, we don't have, you know, complete agreement in all of our universities and in public officials and all of our media about, you know, what the, the good, normal, moral person should be. That would never happen. Uh, that, that'll never see the light of day. And, and it's funny because back in the 50s and 60s, the people that were, were uh, criticizing this corporatist world where there's this conformity Mm -hmm. uh, are were the leftists and now it's the leftists in charge and they're just yelling at us to conform 
Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of respects, it's the same exact people. They're just mm-hmm. old now. <laughs> uh, you know, like Neil Young. Neil yeah. Young, you know, uh, was upset about Joe Rogan. What was Joe Rogan's the thing? That he was upset about Joe Rogan. He wanted I think to, it was the uh, Ivermectin thing, maybe. It might have been, or might have might have been uh, free speech stuff. Mm. Um, with the Twitter thing, maybe, maybe it was a little bit more recent. Oh, could have been. But uh, I mean, for, for somebody who was avant-garde back in the sixties, you know, Neil Young and, and anti-war this and that. And, and now he's like, take me off Spotify because Joe Rogan said some stuff that hurt my feelings. I'm like, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Mm-hmm. And Joe Rogan's a Bernie Sanders supporters for crying out loud. I mean, that's <laughs> a left winger too. Uh, but, yeah. So, uh, the the conformity uh and uh, you know to, to in today's day and age is it's much more dangerous because the 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 idea before uh like in the 50s which everybody seems to hate the 50s for some reason it's like the best decade ever in the history of the united states well i wouldn't say that because they did have problems but um but you know it, it as far as economic growth and all that kind of stuff but you could still say whatever you wanted to say, but people would judge you. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're, they're trying to just shut you down in addition to judging you and saying you're yeah. a horrible person, you know, trying to yeah. get you fired. You yeah. Know? Well, one, only one group of people is allowed to do the judging. You know, the, the other group is not allowed to judge anybody. You can, you can judge people so long as this is according to the, you know, ascribed judgment principles. And if you don't follow those ascribed judgment principles, you are not allowed to judge people. I think is, is generally the, 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 I guess the, the, Orthodoxy. You know the, word of, the orthodoxy. There we go. Well, I am judging them. So the hell yes. with That is I'm, great. I, I, am, I am very judgmental. Mm-hmm. Well, Ellen Ryan, I know you are. Uh, Ellen Ryan ends this chapter with an idea that I don't think I necessarily agree with. Uh, he says, kind of without, you know, this all-powerful leader, a one-party state, a secret police, and the systematic use of terror, you, know, you don't really have this totalitarian regime. Uh, he says, you know, it may be true and perhaps deplorable that most of us are creatures of habit with conventional tastes and careers, that we attach our hopes and fears to our children, vote for the usual political parties, and do not imagine the earthly paradise is imminent. But the fact that we can choose to do something different without fearing a knock on the door from the secret police is not to be slighted. Assimilating the daily round of an affluent, affluent, affluent society to the sheer nastiness of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union is a mistake. And while I do agree with that, you know, we are not as bad as Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. I don't think it's necessarily good to just dismiss all of these worries because we don't have a secret police or we don't have a one party state or we don't have, you know, a horrible, you know, charismatic leader telling us to kill all of the Jews. Like, I think these are still problems, even without all of these these horrible you know elements of fascism and, uh, you know, Stalinism and Nazism. Well, th- and this was written before you 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 had uh, the modern notion of thought police where the, the like, like Kanye West lost his bank. You know, yeah. I mean, he's a lot of crazy stuff. You know, I'm not endorsing anything Kanye West said because <laughs> he's mentally ill and he's wrong. Uh, but, you know, his bank said, we're not going to bank with you anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, that is that is a step beyond anything I've ever heard of before. Mm-hmm. But you've, you've seen the same thing up in Canada with a, that trucker protest. I mean, remember that, the COVID yeah. that trucker protests, they debanked all of them and, and they yeah. see the money that people were donating to this group. They just seized it. They just stole it. Um, and 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 you see, like there was a lady in Great Britain two weeks ago that was arrested for silently praying outside of an abortion clinic. Do you see mm-hmm. that? I did. And, and uh, I think she was just exonerated this last week, uh, or found not guilty or whatever. But they 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 prosecuted her for praying out loud. And so she went back, and she was just standing there. And they said, "What are you doing?" She says, "I'm praying. I'm silently praying." I said, well, "You're under arrest." <laughs> We've been ordered not to pray out here. <laughs> and she's like, well, I didn't say anything, uh, but she went to go lie to him. So, I mean, you, it, 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 I think he, he was writing this before we had those examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this book was published in 2012, just for clarification. Yeah. yeah so, you, you, you know, you, he's, he's about eight years before the craziness hit officially, mm-hmm. the, the COVID crazies. Um, uh, I got it in. The yeah. round. It was almost a full hour, I think. And, uh, but we haven't mentioned Tolkien. I've been I've been I've been <laughs> bringing up the Tolkien the last couple episodes, mm. and that was your your claim to fame, and you haven't done it. That's actually that's actually there's a good point to to throw this in here, um, which is not to say that Sauron was an analogy to to Nazism or communism or anything like that. But one of the central themes in a lot of Tolkien stuff is that there's two two very different kinds of evil. There's a very chaotic evil, 
which is, you know, Morgoth, which is, you know, the more powerful being that was above Sauron, you know, whole whole history there. Uh, but his his flaw was that he wanted to destroy everything. You know, his flaw was was pure destruction, chaos and things like that, whereas Sauron was more successful um, to an extent or would have been more successful um, because his whole regime was ordered. You know, he he made the right alliances. He wanted control. He did not want destruction. He wanted control. Uh, yeah. So so recognizing that, you know, there are different types of evil out there and usually the more powerful is the one that does not seem quite as evil. You know, pure destruction seems more evil than, you know, a totalitarian regime. But, you know, when you look at it, you know, pure destruction will eventually destroy itself. You know, this this ordered evil can maintain and can persist for, for much longer. He also had a, a, an interesting concept of um, people that, that, that are able to prove their mettle by resisting the temptation for power, mm. you know, the ring of power in particular. Uh, that they like I think it was was it um, Gandalf who mentioned something along the lines of I would I would don't tempt me mm-hmm. I would I would use this with the thought of doing good but mm-hmm. I would become more terrible than anything that you could imagine yeah or something along those lines and um, so that's a good segue mm-hmm. good yes. end spot. we finally yes. threw some uh, Tolkien in there at the end I will I will add one one more thing there with with the temptation of people there. Uh, because uh, the, the character of Boromir is actually really good, good uh, example of that. You know, he's he's kind of given a bad rap in the movies, I think. His, his portrayal is more of, you know, greedy, power-hungry man, just sort of from the get-go. Uh, but I think what's forgotten a lot of the time in the book is he is one of the most virtuous, you know, valiant people, you know, in the world. He's the leader of, uh, de facto leader of a lot of Gondor's armies, you know, fighting against this terrible evil. Um, and for him to give in to this temptation to the ring and try to steal it from Frodo is a very big deal in the books. You know, it's not right. kind of given the same weight in the movies. You know, there's right. still some element of, you know, we need this power from the beginning, but it's not, you know, as prominent and stuff like that. You know, it's very, very, very good example of how, you know, even good people who want to do good with it can use it for evil. True, true. Yes. Good point. Yes. Any other thoughts? No. All right. This has been season four, episode 26 of Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. And you can still follow us on Twitter at ULMTD Opinions. Good, good episode. Yes.